To those of you who are wondering as to where Nepal is, it's a small country situated in between India and China. It's a very small country, landlocked com country. So uh, we don't have access to sea. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a country full of mountains. It's about mountains and villages and temples and what you have. No? So it's, a, it's the main uh, core uh, competence of this country is, uh, you must, uh, I must say, it's uh, in tourism. Uh, so it's full of mountains and also this uh, uh, presents a very difficult uh, geography uh, from the development perspective. Now somehow this slide is not working again. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, just to uh, give you a background about my presentation, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, the context within which uh, we are promoting e-governance in Nepal. And uh, I'll be taking stock of our for policy and regulatory institutional environment uh, within which uh, the e-government initiatives are being promoted. And I'll also be taking stock briefly of opportunities and challenges uh, from a developing country perspective. Now, to give you a brief background about Nepal, Nepal is, uh, you know, is one of the uh, uh, least developed countries, and it's, it has a host of development challenges to to attend to. For example, it's a landlocked country, as I mentioned to you before, <coughs> and uh, we're going through a period of uh, political transition. Uh, so, uh, it's uh, the political house is yet to get in order, and. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and the other challenge that we face is that uh, we have the challenge, this daunting task of, uh, of having to provide the social services to the communities that are far flung, uh, that are uh, out of development mainstream, and we have to focus on poverty reduction. And of course, the, the uh, fourth challenge that we uh, must address is the, the challenge of governance reform. So how can you make the governance more inclusive? How can we, you make the governance more accountable uh, along the tenets of uh, good governance? And also we have to be working towards uh, uh, social inclusion. I mean, that's not, that's been, uh, this has been an area that uh, has been s sort of neglected so far. So uh, this is another imperative that we must be working towards, the social inclusion. Now. Uh, and in terms of general ICT scenario, uh, this, uh, I don't want to go into uh, uh, exhaustive statistics here, but then again, the telecom penetration is on the rise, especially in the mobile sector, it's on the rise. And uh, there has been uh, uh, impressive uptake of internet penetration, but we are not there as yet, so I think we have miles to go. But then again, uh, the, the, over the recent years, the, in, the internet penetration is also in the rise. And there are some issues relating to ICTs that we must grapple with. That's first and foremost is broadband. If you think about leveraging ICTs to provide services to the far-flung remote communities, and the, the issue of uh, infrastructure comes to fore and, and becomes very uh, 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 significant. So we have issues with the broadband, given the geography of Nepal and all that, and given the and the, the resources that, uh, that the government in Nepal can be, uh, bring to bear upon broadband rollout and all that. And we do also have some kind of power issues. So I think this defines the context within which uh, Nepal's e-government initiative need to be positioned. We have our own developmental aspirations within which we want to position this e-government initiative. In the right hand side of the picture, you can see a guy climbing up a tree to fix up a Wi-Fi antenna, and uh, there's, there's so much hope that communities have put on the, the transformative potential of ICTs. But having said that, I think the, we must, the, the, the initiatives that we undertake must be positioned to our ground, ground realities. Now, now, now going uh, to Nepal's EGOV journey, taking stock of Nepal's EGOV journey, I think, uh, this is ongoing process. It's not a complete process, I and mean, we are not there as yet. So it's an ongoing initiative. It's, in fact, it started officially at, uh, in the year 2005 uh, with the formulation of what we call e-government master plan. So this was uh, the, this was completed through the support of uh, the government of Republic Korea, and also and uh, the projects based on this master plan, this e-government master plan were formulated uh, with the support of Asian Development Bank. And, and of course, uh, we received funding from the Asian Development Bank. 
Uh, these government projects will run till 2024, so that's uh, until when we will have this uh, first phase of this initiative, 2024. And, uh, sorry. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of vision and mission that's, uh, that we have uh, adopted uh, into this e-government master plan, we uh, think that it will lead to a couple of uh, uh, key words there and uh, objectives there is, uh, I think, uh, the, the, the idea is to, to, to bring about a citizen-centered government and a transparent government, efficient and network government. So, so this is the, the, the vision that's, uh, that the, the e-government master plan has adopted, the government of Nepal has adopted. So uh, through this means, the hope being that we can make the governance more citizen-centric, and we can uh, do away with the instances of corruption and all that, make it more transparent. And uh, of course, we can achieve the goals of good governance and, and efficient governance. And at the end, maybe we, we will have this, uh, uh, the goal of having a networked government in place. Now, let me give you a brief on policy and regulatory framework. Uh, I think uh, the, I don't want to go into very detail into that, but it's not a very exhaustive policy and regulatory framework there, but uh, then again, uh, we have three major policy uh, instruments that uh, we think uh, relates to the e-government initiative. We don't have e-governance act or regulations per se, but I think some of the provisions that the act or regulation uh, uh, addresses in other countries are taken care of the, 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 through the, the policy instrument that we have. For example, first and foremost, we do have an IT policy which not only, of course, not only talks about e-governance, but, but talks about the whole gamma of uh, IT and how you can leverage ICTs to bring about development, also economic growth, and how you can move up the value chain through, through IT and all that. So I think uh, it's, it's a comprehensive policy. And uh, we do have a telecommunications policy uh, in place. I mention this specifically because it is through this policy that the sector has been liberalized. It is through this policy that we have uh, the sector has become more competitive, and I think it's, it, the credit goes to this policy that, that we have seen the uh, 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 intensified uptake of uh, uh, telecommunication uh, technologies in the country. So, so I think uh, that's another major policy instrument there. And third policy instrument that, uh, the uh, third uh, pol uh, 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 instrument that we have is in the form of act, uh, that's called Electronic Transaction Act. That is the, uh, that, that, in a way, uh, forms the basis for uh, legality of electronic transaction carried out within the country. And that also takes care of uh, the cyber security related issues, cyber crime related issues. So it's a comprehensive act that, uh, that enables the government of Nepal to go into transactions based uh, e-government uh, uh, model. Now, in terms of actors and institutions, of course, I could have elaborated it a little uh, uh, better, but, but then again, we have a couple of institutions there which are directly related to, to uh, uh, e-government. Now, then again, compared to other countries, we don't have one agency per se responsible for all e-government activities. It's a distributed uh, execution uh, uh, model. But then again, we do have uh, uh, two major agencies that are responsible for coordinating e-government activities uh, across the agencies. One is high-level commission of, for IT, the, the commission that I represent. The other is office of the prime minister and council of ministers. So these two agencies are responsible for coordinating e-government related activities. Now, I say the coordination is the key word here. I mean, they don't have any other uh, uh, say in that. Uh, it's, I, I already told you it's a d d distributed execution model. In, in addition to that, uh, uh, there is uh, Nepal Telecom Authority uh, who are responsible for, for making sure that the e-government initiative is backed by uh, infrastructure rollout in the rural areas, for example. And, uh, and of course, we do have control of certification authority, the, the agency that looks after digital signature, cybercrime, uh, etc. And we do have a number of uh, project executing agencies. So, so uh, it's just kind of a mixed bag uh, in the sense that there are so many agencies involved in the uh, implementation of uh, e-government. But then again, two agencies are at the top. For example, a high-level commission for IT is responsible for coming up what we call enterprise architecture of the, of the uh, government, uh, so uh, the e-government initiative. 
So that's the that's the uh, the foundational activity that we are engaged in, in addition to other uh, networking uh, coordination work that uh, we do. Now, in terms of project component, here again, I don't want to go into detail, but then again, it is. Uh, four major components there. Of course, uh, uh, at the top you would see rural connectivity because Nepal, you know, is, is a rural country. I mean, uh, if you forget uh, the, the rural population, the villages and all that, then e-government uh, will end up being an elitist agenda. So I think you cannot forget the rural areas. So first and foremost, there's a sizable uh, amount of uh, money that's been set aside to enhance rural connectivity, provide connectivity to the villages and all that. Uh, so that they can avail uh, uh, themselves of e-government services. Now, there's also government-to-government -government network uh, that we are currently working on. This is go and also government groupware. So that will uh, help us in a, uh, achieve the vision of, uh, say, network uh, governments, uh, tr uh, establishing network between government agencies. Now, third is uh, we have a number of e-government applications. I don't want to go into details there, but then again, some key applications is enterprise architecture and database for national identification. We are working on a NID a database uh, and uh, some other applications. And another major component, of course, is when it comes to implementing uh, e-government uh, and initiatives of that, uh, that nature then uh, the, the, one of the bottlenecks that we face is, is that of serious capacity gaps at the institutional level, at the government level. So, so that's another major component of this, uh, this initiative that, uh, whereby uh, we seek to strengthen the capacity of the institutions. So this is a diagram showing a high-level design of government enterprise architecture. I can explain that to you, to you in detail if I had uh, time. But then again, it's basically uh, outlines the approach that we have adopted in, 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 uh, uh, in terms of architecture uh, for delivering government services. It talks about system-oriented, um, it talks about SOA and uh, uh, talks about national portal and talks about a security infrastructure that has to be in place and all that. Uh, but uh, we won't have time to go into detail on that. But this is a brief schematic outlining the architecture of the government initiative. Now, uh, this is the basic service delivery landscape that we have provided for. I mean, they, uh, this is pretty simple, pretty straightforward uh, uh, diagram there. The, uh, it's, it's been envisioned that all the services that uh, would be channeled through what we call uh, enterprise service bus. That would be the uh, the integration platform, uh, interoperability platform, uh, through which the, the uh, all interaction uh, would uh, take place, be it in the G2G or G2C or G2B space. I mean that is the enterprise architecture would be at the core of uh, this uh, EGO uh, initiative of uh, of Nepal. Now this is the brief uh, diagram on the right side of, uh, about the portal that uh, we have uh, uh, deployed. Now let's go to opportunities and challenges. I think uh, I can tell you from development world, uh, developing world perspective that uh, there are many uh, opportunities first of all. Uh, uh, so first and foremost there has been impressive uh, growth in telecom penetration. This, that is in a comparative scale. You cannot compare it with any developed country. But then again, in terms of uptake of mobile telecom, in terms of rollout of infrastructure, I think the growth has been impressive. And we take it as an opportunity. And uh, now, over the past two to three years, I would not go beyond that, uh, I have seen that, that the public sector has become more receptive to technology enablement. So we have some shining examples of, uh, of IT uses in the public sector and through that means uh, uh, value generation in the public sector. For example, public procurement could be one area where we have seen uh, 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 um, significant uptake of IT and through that means uh, some changes in the way the public procurement is done in, in the positive sense. And tax administration, this, that, that goes predates uh, uh, the e-government initiative. These agencies have been uh, have been more amenable to, to IT and, and e-governance before even we conceptualized uh, this master plan. So they have done some very interesting work there and uh, security agencies and all that. Uh, so that's uh, in terms of uh, uh, receptivity, I think it's also there. Uh, 
And I would say that, uh, of course, uh, going through the presentations yesterday, I could see that countries do have uh, e-governance act uh, and other legal instruments in place. But in terms of basic uh, framework, regulatory policy framework or legal framework, I think we do have that in place. Uh, but we can build up on that incrementally. Uh, but in terms of basic framework, I think we have that. Uh, and uh, the, the approach that we have uh, adopted in trying to come up with the eGov initiative is, uh, for example, government enterprise architecture, national uh, government interoperability framework has opened up other opportunities also. So, so that has uh, that has so kind of forced us to go back to your to our uh, uh, design board and uh, rethink some of the approaches that we have taken and, and opened up a few opportunities there, which I can explain when I have time. Now, now, there's more vocal citizenry. I mentioned to you about political changes that Nepal is going through. Now, people are demanding services. People are demanding uh, response from the government uh, in, a most, uh, uh, in a more significant manner. Uh, so I think that also is the opportunity. Now, in terms of challenges, of course, there are many challenges, of course, coming from a developing country. Uh, one of the first and foremost challenges would be the connectivity issues. So, Nepal, given the difficult terrain, I think it applies to uh, uh, many developing countries. Uh, it's not only uh, um, the access that we're talking about, it's also affordability. I mean, uh, if you look at the statistics, a uh, simple broad broadband connection will eat into so many percentages of your GNI. <laughs> so, so I think uh, that's the one area that needs to be uh, improved. Uh, I think uh, we will see improvement in the days to come, but right now it's very challenging. Bandwidth cost, uh, connectivity cost are uh, uh, at times prohibitive, uh, especially if you go to broadband. Now, the other thing is, of course, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is sounding like a cliche, but then again, it's uh, change management issues. Big time in Nepal, big time in a country like ours, where you have very entrenched bureaucratic uh, uh, setup, uh, very entrenched uh, uh, rules and regulation in place, and and sometimes uh, change management becomes a real issue. And we are experiencing that in this initiative, big time. So so uh, sometimes it's frustrating, I must admit. Uh, but then again, uh, that's the major one of the major uh, uh, challenges that we face. And the third is, of course, uh, leadership and political will. Uh, we have undertaken, as you can see, a sizable e-government initiative that seeks to transform uh, the government as we know it. I mean, to pull that off, I think the type of uh, uh, leadership and political you, uh, will that needs to be brought uh, to bear upon this e-government strategies, I must admit it's not, it's, 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 it's lacking at the moment. I mean. Uh, uh, so, so I think we have not uh, secured that uh, to the extent that we'd like to see. And there are glaring capacity gaps in institutions responsible for executing e-governance. So, uh, yeah, uh, so we don't have, for example, uh, uh, IT career stream per se. So, uh, so, um, uh, so we don't have, uh, and CIO would be a far cry. We don't have uh, CIOs and all that. So. So I think that's one area that we need to be uh, working on more extensively in the days to come. So as it is, there are institutional capacity gaps that needs to be bridged, and that's another challenge that I have listed out. And the other thing that I see is that uh, in order for the e-government initiative to be relevant, especially given competing priorities that countries like Nepal have to address, uh, the services that we provide have to be relevant to the community. For example, you mentioned about driving license, and Nepal is, is uh, I don't know how many people, uh, uh, it's a mountainous country, you know? I mean, uh, the sizable pro uh, portion of the population, uh, they don't drive. <laughs> so, so things like that, I, in terms of service portfolio and all that, uh, it has to be relevant. It has to be tailored to bridging the, the, the service delivery gaps uh, to the communities. And there's also sustainability issues that uh, total cost of ownership of this initiative, this, this is also one of the major issues that needs to be factored in. And that's, that's the challenge because, because you know technology is, is always evolving. And uh, there's definite uh, TCO, to total cost of ownership involved in, in maintaining these systems, maintaining data centers, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and at the same time uh, uh, moving up the value chain. You know? 
then I think uh, the, this needs, uh, this, these issues also need to be factored in. Uh, so I don't know how I'm doing time-wise. Uh, I'll be happy to answer uh, your questions, queries uh, from there. Uh, uh, this is all I have to say. But lastly, uh, uh, some key imperatives that needs to be factored in. I will go through them uh, quickly. Uh, first, of, first and foremost, I mean, this goes applies to all developing countries, underdeveloped countries. You have to secure political will. I don't know how you can do that. <laughs> so you have to come up with an engagement mod uh, modality with, uh, with the politicians, with the power that be, uh, uh, in, the t in order to build the social and leadership capital that's required to see the successful execution of projects like this. And you have to inst uh, enhance institutional capacities. And uh, you revisit policy and regulatory environment. I see uh, 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 urgent need to do that, uh, having gone through some other presentation here. And of course, improve connectivity if you want to be relevant, if you want e the e-government to, to reach out to the communities, uh, improve com uh, connectivity. Of course, then I think that should be number one rather than number four. And of course, we should be promoting innovation. I think uh, this, uh, I mentioned to you about the uptake of mobile telephony the popularity of social media on the, uh, and all that. So I think that we have to find ways of nurturing or driving innovation around these technologies so that they can be relevant to the masses, so that they can be uh, an, a, a channel for e-government service delivery in a more effective uh, way. Now, with this, uh, I have come to the end of my presentation. I'm sorry I had to rush through the slides, <laughs> but thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.